Sunday morning. It's a blessing to be here. Hope that you're looking forward to hearing from the Lord today. I'm going to ask Jacob to come up, lead us in a few songs. Uh, we'll do some announcements and uh, try to get some things back to kind of normal, uh, just having an organization of everything. Uh, I don't ever want this to become normal. I don't want it to, to be to the place where we get used to it, but in the same sense, I, I do believe that it needs to be organized and, and uh, everything together. So, amen. All right, Jake, lead us in a few songs. Please take your songbooks and turn to page 102. He hideth my soul. If you have souls stirring him, it would be on page 102. He hideth my soul.
page 143. Normally, me and Brother Richard kid around about this one, and I always tell him I don't like this song. And uh, that's only because I have trouble playing it on the violin. This is a, uh, a very good song that Fanny Cros Crosby uh, wrote. Let's uh, give this one a shot. <clears throat> Blessed assurance. still being preached 
And there's some that still want to hear it and uh, need it as well. There's some that still need to be saved. So you don't know uh, what you might do by letting someone know that they're out, that we're out there, and uh, they can tune in and listen. I want to remind you. I had mentioned on uh, Wednesday night when we had service that. On the 19th, which is this Tuesday, we're going to have a men's meeting at 7 o'clock here at the church. So, uh, men, if you're able to come, I'd love to have you come, be part of it. I've got some things I want to discuss with you and some directions <clears throat> as we kind of look at coming back and, and getting some things going again here at the church. And so I encourage you to come be a part of that 7 o'clock on Tuesday night so that I've got time to announce things Wednesday for service and uh, kind of get back to, to going and I don't want us to lose focus we're here for a purpose I don't want us to get stagnant and uh, I want us to continue to serve so the uh, Lord's blessed us with this opportunity that we can uh, still be able to reach out but in the same sense I don't want us to be complacent here and uh, I want us to go ahead and continue to move forward we've got a few uh, an anniversary and we've got a birthday this week so brother Stephen's going to He's going to get older this week, and then Brother James and Sister Eda are having their anniversary, and all of that happened on Saturday, the 23rd. I will say this was one of the hardest calendars I've had to print out. Uh, Jonathan's birthday is the 23rd as well, and this was the first calendar that I've done that we didn't put him on there. And I know some would say, why not? Well, it's because he's a member of another church, and uh, this is for the members of the church, so uh, I didn't put him on there, but nonetheless... It was definitely a hard time. And uh, so my boys, my older two boys, are four years and four days apart. They've always said that they do things four years difference. And uh, I don't know that Jacob didn't come out of the womb four years old. Because as soon as he was able to eat everything that John was doing, Jacob thought he was at that age too. And so Jacob's always been four years older than what he is. So he's excited because next week he turns 21. But we, don't, we aren't singing to him yet. We might have to bring a paddle in to sing to him next week. So uh, we'll just see how that works. So let's sing happy birthday to Brother Stephen. Brother Stephen, I'm proud of you. Thank you. You're my, one of my Timothys, and uh, I'm proud of you. Glad you're having a birthday. I know you're almost 30. Uh, I know that you don't turn 30 this year, but you're almost 30. And uh, I remember I was getting ready to turn 30. Actually, when I turned 30, I didn't say a word. But when I turned 21, I was like, boy, I'm nine years from 30. And... Uh, so at 30 years old, my family had a black birthday for me because it was such a big deal. So uh, you've only got a year or so away from it. And uh, I, do, uh, I do thank you. And so we'll sing happy birthday, Brother Stephen. And then we'll sing happy anniversary to Brother James and Sister Idra. And uh, thank you for their faithfulness and uh, their, their longevity. Listen, I know they've been married many years, and, and that's a testimony. And I'm thankful for the patience that they had with each other. And I'm thankful for how God has put them together. And they served together. And I'm thankful for that. That is a testimony. So let's sing happy birthday to Brother Stephen. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Now let's sing happy anniversary to Brother James and Sister Eva. Happy anniversary to y'all. Happy anniversary to y'all. Happy anniversary. God bless y'all. Happy anniversary to y'all. Amen. I do want to, once again, I want to thank everyone for being faithful. Uh, the Not just in attendance, but also in tithing. Uh, I know there's a lot of churches right now that are concerned because folks aren't, aren't coming to church, and so they're not tithing to the church. And yet every time I go get mail, I see that someone's mailed in, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. I just want to say thank you for being faithful, uh, not just to the church, but to the Lord. Really, it's a command of the Lord. It's not a command of the church. And uh, I'm thankful for that faithfulness that you would have. Of course, this is the time that we'd normally take up that love, uh, take up the offering, Lord. Uh, Lord provides. And really, it's just receiving. It's not taking up. No one makes you. Uh, I think about the offerings that God has desired, those free will offerings. Yes, tithe's a command, but he wants you to give it from a willing heart. And I'm thankful for that. And uh, just your faithfulness to the Lord uh, through that as well. I haven't seen any financial uh, statement that's came through that we're going, oh man, what are we going to do? 
and that God always provides. Even when you're not faithful, God provides, and uh, I'm thankful for that. It's not because of me. It's not because of you. It's all because of Him, and I just want to want to thank you for it. I am going to pray, and then I'm going to ask Jacob to uh, I'm going to ask Jacob to lead us in another song, and then I'll come up and preach. So let's let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you for this day. Lord, just how you've provided for us and, and how you take care of us, Lord. I'm thankful for the encouragement uh, through the faithfulness, Lord, not just to your members, but, Lord, I'm encouraged through your faithfulness and how you provide and how you take care of us. And then, Lord, I, I do pray that you'd meet with us. I know that there's some that may be struggling today. There's some may, may be hurting today. Lord, I, there may be some that uh, are in a, in a position, Lord, that they're not sure what tomorrow is going to hold. But Lord, I pray that you would just help and comfort through the message today. I pray as well that you would encourage as only you can. I do thank you. As we get to celebrate anniversaries and birthdays, Lord, I, I'm thankful for those times that we're able to grow older. And But Lord, I pray that as we grow older physically, Lord, that we would also grow more mature spiritually. Lord, that should be everyone's desire. It doesn't matter how old or how young we are, that we would grow closer to you. And then, Lord, I, I think about uh, the wife of of my youth, Lord, that you've given me. And Lord, as I think about Brother James and Sister Edra and their anniversary that's coming up, and Lord, what a blessing it is that they've been married so many years and so faithful, Lord. I pray that you would just continue to touch them and bless them. And Father, I do pray you'd meet with us today. And Lord, just have a special service. Have, a, have your touch upon us. And we just beg you for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, okay. Please take your song turn to page 55 when the roll is called up yonder. Page 55. <clears throat> when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the glory of his resurrection share, when the same thunder shall gather over on the other shore. until Friday 
And I said, you know, I'm all right with that because there's some preachers that don't know what they're preaching until Sunday morning. And so I'm quite fine with the Lord giving it to me Friday. And uh, I'm thankful for that time of study. And, and this was just in my daily reading. I've shared with you before that I try to read two chapters of Psalms a day. And uh, some would say, preacher, why is that? And, well, I believe it's to help keep me sweet. Uh, and I know some of you, I just, my wife just looked at me like I need to read two extra chapters. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I do believe that the psalm would keep you sweet and uh, it helps to cheer you up and lift you up and encourage you. And so I encourage you, read a couple chapters of psalms each day. And I know you're going to say, preacher, you want me to read two book, two chapters out of the book of Psalms a day, and you want me to read a book of Proverbs or a chapter out of the book of Proverbs a day, and you want me to read in some other place a day, it's okay. And I think about how much time we spend on the, uh, the internet. I think about how much time we spend on Facebook and all these things. And so I, I uh, encourage you to spend less time in those and more time in the Word of God and uh, really get some good out of it and really get some growth out of it. Psalm chapter number 63, Psalm 63 is where we're going to be today. Psalm 63, I encourage you to get a Bible and uh, get in here with me and I'm going to show you some things that's... Uh, I don't know if they're really going to excite you as much as they did me, but it definitely, as I was reading this, God just really illuminated it to me. It's not that I hadn't uh, read it before. In fact, I've got so many marks here where I've been before uh, that it's not even funny, but yet uh, God still brings me something new each time. Psalm 63, verse number one. If you're there, let's stand for the reading of God's word. Psalm 63 and verse number one. The Bible says, O God, thou art my God, Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up mine eyes, or my eyes, in thy, I'm sorry, I will lift up my hands in thy name. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come to your house, Lord, to hear your word, and uh, just preach your truth. And Father, I pray you would encourage us, Lord. I pray that you'd give us direction through your word, that, Father, give us direction uh, through this world, Lord, that we would understand how to walk, and then, Lord, as well, uh, that we would understand your will for our life. And, Father, I pray that you just touch us and encourage us tonight or today, Lord. I pray, Father, uh, for the message. Lord, I don't know who's out there listening. I don't know who might need the, uh, this specifically for them. I know I've already rejoiced in it. I've already chewed on it, Lord. I pray that I'd be able to deliver it as, as you gave it to me. Lord, I'm just your mouthpiece. I pray that you could hide me behind the cross of Calvary, Lord. Encourage that one that's there that needs it. Lord, I pray for that sinner that may need to be saved. I pray for that saint that may need some encouragement, some revival, Lord. I pray that you'd touch them and just help them. And then, Father, I pray your will would be done. In Jesus' precious name, amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. We look here at, at Psalm 63. And uh, I, I believe that this is one of the sweetest psalms that we can find. I look here at the title of it. It says, A Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. And so as I consider that, I look at the place of his penning. I look at the place when he penned this down. It was the wilderness of Judah. I look and I think about this uh, setting that would be, and I, I think about Judah, I think about Israel, I, I think about that setting of the, the promised land and this promised place that God had provided. And we would think about all the bounty, we would think about all the beauty, we would think about all the inhabitants that would be there, and yet David says this was when I was in that wilderness in Judah. And I would just uh, want you to understand, I would want you to come to that, that realization that although Israel was blessed and although Israel was bountiful, there was a place 
that there would be less inhabitants. There was a place that would have less bounty. There was a place that would have less beauty. And may I tell you that it's, just, it's no different for us today. There's some times in our life that God has blessed us and God has inhabited with us and God has just uh, flourished in us. And there's some times that that doesn't always exist. This dry and, and desert land, this, this place where no water is, and this, this time in his life when he was just, just dried out and needed some encouragement, dried out and needed some hope and some help. Man, I, I look and I think about this, this discouragement that comes into our life, the distress that comes, the distractions that come. And then I find as well, not just the place of his penning, I find the passion of the psalmist. If I was to look down here into verse number two, and uh, we'll look at this entire chapter tonight, but I just I want us to mainly look at the first two verses this morning. But I think about verse number two. He says, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. I would think about these early days of, of worship and of course we know that David had Jerusalem it was the, the city of David there it was a place and he desired he desired to build a house for God and yet David was not allowed to because he had too much blood on his hand he was a man of war and, but yet Solomon was able but that never stopped David from worshiping God that never stopped David from enjoying the house of God that never stopped David from wanting to be with God. In fact the Bible records David as a man after his own heart. In fact it goes on and it says that David only failed God with the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now we both know that uh, David was still a sinner. David was a murderer. David was an adulterous man. And yet God said that David was a man after his own heart because he desired the things of God. He desired to be what God wanted him to be. Although he fell short, David still loved him and he had a passion. And may I tell you that it wasn't about the fact that he missed offering up the sacrifices, that he missed the ordinances of God. No, he missed the God of the ordinances. I know that I miss us having church, and I miss us being able to see everyone, and we'll look at this in a, in a moment, but I, I miss our, our norm. I miss, and I don't know if it's ever going to be, we've already discussed, uh, we want the buses to run, but when? We want the church to be full, but when? We want to, we want all of these things, but when? And, and listen, I miss all of our things that we normally have, our, our Sunday school, our children's church, our normal services, but may I tell you, that what David missed, it wasn't the, the practicalities of church. It wasn't the participation of church. No, it was the presence of God. And he missed the God of the sanctuary. He missed the God of the ordinances. And that was his passion. And so I think about the wilderness of life that we go through from time to time. Shouldn't make us out of tune for this sacred song. I want you to remember that the book of Psalms are actually songs. This is a song book. And David would have sang this song. Now I have no idea how the tune went. And I have no idea how it was. But how beautiful are the words. How beautiful is the thought of this psalmist writing this down in a song and singing this in his, from his heart. That he loved the Lord even in this time that he's in the wilderness of Judah. And I find... Matthew Henry in his commentary had said, thankful we are in the wilderness of Judah, not sin. You see, he was thankful to be in the wilderness of Judah and how he missed God. And we'd say, preacher, we're in a dry and thirsty land today. I would even say that often it seems that there's no water in the land. I look here and I find in verse number 1 of Psalm 63 at the very end, or I guess about midway down, he says, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. But may I tell you there's a good news today. There is some water in the land. You see, you can have a, a fresh cup. You can have a satisfying cup. I think about Revelation chapter number 22 
Then verse number 17, the Bible says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Boy, I'm thankful that if you're here today and you're lost, that you can still come. I'm thankful that it's the bride that says come. You say, preacher, who's the bride? It's the church. The church says come. It might be a dry and thirsty land. It might be a land where you think no water is, but there's still a fountain of flowing today. There's still an opportunity to come and drink from that water that gives life freely. I look here at verse number one of Psalm 63. He says, my soul thirsted. He goes on down and he's talking there about that dry and thirsty land. That word thirsty down there in verse number one is speaking about faint, exhausted, weary. It's a feeling of painful sensation of the throat for want to drink. Very dry, having no moisture, parched. You say, preacher, every one of us have been thirsty. Oh, but not like this thirst. You see, the problem is, is we are oh, thirsty. We go and we uh, drink a gallon of sweet tea or we go and we get some lemonade or we go and we get some soda or we go and, but may I tell you, there's nothing that quenches thirst like water. I remember when I joined the military, uh, you was issued a canteen and you didn't get to put it anywhere except your cargo pocket of your pants. And you had to have it full at all times. And yes, you'd have to go and uh, you didn't walk. When I was in, when I enlisted, you didn't walk in the military. And boy, you'd, you'd take off and uh, wherever they said to go, you'd, you would run there. And if they called you over there, you would run over to them. And, uh, but there was, at any given time, they would tell you to drink water. Now, I, I went to boot camp. It was winter time. You say, preacher, what's so dangerous about the winter time? And uh, why would you need to drink water? Actually, more people are dehydrated in the winter because you don't think you need to drink water. And you don't recognize it being dry. You don't recognize yourself getting parched. May I tell you the problem with America is we don't even realize that we're a parched land. We don't even realize how faint we are and how weary we are. I'm talking about from the church to the lost world. We don't realize we we are in that church age and i know i've preached it many times about the laodicean church that had need of nothing but i'm thankful that there's three thirsts that still exist today three thirsts and i'm thankful i have the answer to it jesus is that drink of cold water he is that one he is that wellspring and so i want us to look this morning at three drinks or three thirsts that still exist three thirsts that still exist I just simply titled this. I, I know some of you had seen it on the, the uh, YouTube title, but I just simply put it as a question. Thirsty? We should be today. May I tell you, this world around us is still thirsty. They're looking for something. I'm thankful I have the answer, what they need today. And so if you would look at this, the first thirst that I find is thirsty for the purity of God. Thirsty for the purity of God. I find here in Matt, I'm sorry, in uh, Psalm 63, verse number one, the Bible says, O God, thou art my God. Thou art my God. Now, I want us to claim possession here because may I tell you that not everyone can say that. Not everyone can say, O God, thou art my my God, as David claims out, as David cries out, he says, thou art my God. You say, preacher, why would we hunger and thirst or why would we be so thirsty for the purity of God? I'm glad you asked. Take your Bibles, look over the book of Matthew. Now I'm going to have you turn into several places today. It's all right. It'll give you good practice. Matthew, the very first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter number five. I want you to look if you would. In Matthew 5, I want you to look at verse number 6. In verse number 6 in Matthew chapter number 5. In Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 6, the Bible says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I know you're going to say, Preacher, this is talking about thirsting after the righteousness of 
of God. That's exactly what I said. We're looking and we're thirsting for the purity of God. And what this thirst does is it brings salvation. We see his righteousness. Listen to me. People today are still looking for a God. Maybe it's the God of self-enjoyment. And they're going to do everything that they can to please self. And they're going, to, they're going to focus on self. And may I tell you, at the end of their life, they're going to say the very same thing that Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's all vain without God. And they're looking maybe for the, the satisfaction of stuff. You know, Saul was hid behind the stuff when he was supposed to be anointed king. May I tell you that by the time you get done, all you have is a bunch of stuff. And it does not please. It does not satisfy. And so I look and I think about the fact that everyone is looking for a God today. Oh, it may be the God of, of self and the fact that you've lifted self up. It may be the God of stuff that you want more and you want more and you want more. The Bible says that covetousness is idolatry. And so I look and I think about uh, our, our world today. I, I think about the, the fact of how they are searching and they're looking for a God. They're trying to find a God that's going to please them. It's amazing to me at how we lift up celebrities. It's amazing to me at how we lift up all these sports figures and all that they can do. But may I tell you that they're all mortal. I think it was well uh, as we think about those statues. Boy, I'm going to I'm going to have this god that I'm going to put here and I'm going to put him up on a shelf and when I I need something I'm going to go to him, I'm going to bow down and when he gets dusty I'm going to have to dust him off and and when I want to move him here or if I want to move something under him, I'm going to have to pick him up. May I tell you that's not a god at all. I know you're going to say preacher, I don't have a statue. Listen, I'm afraid that we have more dead gods in our life than we could ever count if we would truly be honest. Our vehicles, our homes, our hobbies, our habits. I wonder how many gods we really have, but may I tell you that we need to be thirsty for the purity of God. You see, the thirst for the purity of God brings right brings salvation because we see his righteousness. I look here in Matthew 5 and verse number 6. It says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. And so I look here and I find that as we see his righteousness, we find him. In Matthew, I'm sorry, Jeremiah chapter number 29 and verse number 13, the Bible says, And ye shall seek him. Seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. I wonder if we've come to the place that we need to put down our other gods and just search for the real God and see him and thirsty for that purity of God. Isaiah 41 and verse number 17, the Bible says, When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake him, forsake them. Boy, I'm thankful I, I can see his righteousness. But when I look at him and I see his righteousness, all I see is my rags. You see, it says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. I, I look here and I, I, I hunger and thirst for his righteousness. And when I look at him and I see this righteous God and the purity of God, I can only see the impurity of self. I can only see the rags I have to offer. And the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter number 64, in verse number 6, it tells us that but we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we do, uh, we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. You know, I realize that I'm preaching about the rags, but I was thinking about this as I looked over this passage again. You know what happens with the wind? And it, it, it says that our, our iniquities, like the wind, have driven us away. But you know what the wind does after a rain? It dries out the land. A few weeks ago, or maybe it's been a month now, I think this week we're supposed to have some rain coming in and, and definitely need it. But I remember after we had, it seemed like the monsoon, we got two months worth of rain in a day, and we, we had monsoon season and everything was flooded. In fact, 
Uh, all I've got to do is try to level out my driveway, and I promise you it's going to rain. I thought about getting on the tractor and trying that because, uh, boy, you want to talk about a mud pit. And we just had a mess in the yard and uh, tried to get everything all leveled out and all ready, and, and uh, then it rained. The next day, it, it just made a mess. I said, Preacher, what are you getting at? I remember after that monsoon, the wind started, and it blew, and it blew, and it blew, and it blew. You know what our iniquities do? And they drive us out. He says, like the wind, they've drive, driven us away. It's, it's brought us to that place. You know why America is such a dry and thirsty land? Because there's a whole lot of iniquity here. And it's not because of the homosexual crowd. It's not because of, of Hollywood. It's not because of the, the liberal movement. It's not because of the accept my sin. No one can judge me but God. Listen to me. It's because... We're sinners. It's not because of our name, America. It's not because of, of our founding as Americans. It's, it's because we're sinners. And sin has made this land a dry land. It's made it a land that is thirsty. It's made it a land that seems as if there's no water there. And so I look here and I find that they're thirsty for the purity of God. And that thirst brings salvation. But that thirst also goes a step further. It brings saturation. You see, it tells us in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 6, it says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. They shall be filled. May I tell you, that's filled to the point of saturation. That's not just filled in the fact that yeah, you're going to absorb it in and then you're going to be lacking again. No, that's so saturated that there's no more space to put it. I look and I think about John chapter number four. You don't have to hold your place in Matthew, but turn over to John chapter four. I've got several verses I want you to find here. There's a problem that we have today. We get saved and we think that that's all the thirst that we need. Boy, I hate it. Preacher, I've looked for the purity of God. I've seen how righteous he is. I've seen my fault. The Bible tells us that there's none good, no, not one. The Bible says for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And it tells us that the wages of that sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life from Jesus Christ our Lord. And so I called upon him as it tells us in Romans chapter number 10 and verse number 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And boy, I've done that. And I've gotten saved. And now everything's great. And I'm going to go on my merry little way. Well, the problem is, is we're supposed to hunger and thirst after his righteousness. And we're going to be filled. You're getting this, aren't you? You see, the problem that most have, they want to come and they want to get a drink of the water. And then they want to try to walk away from the water. But God's design and God's plan and God's purity is to saturate us. Notice this, John chapter number four. When we find Jesus there at the well in Sychar, speaking to the, the woman who didn't have one husband, but she had had five. And the one that she was with wasn't even her husband. She was just sacked up. In Matthew, I'm sorry, in John chapter number four, look at verse number 14. It says, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Look on over to John chapter 7. Boy, we need to come to that place that we're saturated with the Spirit of God. Of course, we know Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 18, it says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. In John chapter number 7, verse number 37, and the Bible says in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. And the Holy Ghost was not yet given, 
because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And I know some of you are going to say, Preacher, uh, that means that all I've got to do is get saved and the Holy Spirit comes and he dwells in me and therefore I have rivers of flowing water. And boy, I'm always, I'm going to be saturated. No, listen, I'm afraid that if we were honest, most of us have grieved the Holy Spirit so much that he really doesn't saturate us very often. We're so full of ourselves that the saturation of the Spirit isn't even an issue. We've grieved him and we've, we've quenched the Spirit to where he doesn't, uh, we're not thirsty for the purity of God anymore. It's amazing to me at how many want to give an excuse for why they won't live according to what the Word of God says. Because we're not thirsty for the Word of God. But I'm thankful there's still some that are thirsty. They want to know that they, they can be saved and they can come to that place. And then once they get saved, they grow. They grow. And they've grown to the point that they are saturated because they're thirsty. For the purity of God. But notice as well. I look back at Psalm 63. And I find. The second thirst. That's present today. Is thirsty for the presence of God. Thirsty for the presence of God. I want to point a few things out here. David. Had seen. The presence of God. Notice in verse number 2. To see thy power. And thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. And listen, David knew the presence of God. Boy, he wasn't missing the people of Israel. He's in the wilderness now. He's in that desert place. He's all alone. He's secluded. He's not missing the people. He's not missing the palace. He's not missing the pomp. He's not missing all of the, the, the glory of it. No, he's missing the presence of of God. Notice this. Look at verse 1. Just in verse number 1 and 2, I want to point out the pronouns toward God. In verse number 1, notice this. Oh God, and I know you can say, preacher, he's talking about God right there. I got it. Look at verse, look at verse 1. Oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee. In a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Look at verse 2. To see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Go on to verse 3. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. We could go all the way through here. May I tell you what he was desiring was the presence of God. He was thirsty for God to be with him. I want you to take your Bibles now. Hold your place in Psalm 63. But look over in Psalm chapter number 42. Psalm 42. Look at verse number 1. Psalm chapter 42, look at verse number 1. I'm going to give you several verses here, and then I'm going to preach to you a minute. Psalm chapter number 42, look at verse number 1. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My, third, my soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? Look on over into Psalm chapter number 84. Look at verse number 2. Psalm 84. Look at verse 2. Psalm chapter number 84. And verse number 2. He says, My soul longeth. Yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Look over in Psalm chapter number 143. Psalm 143. And look at verse number 6. Psalm 143 and verse number 6. I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee. As a thirsty land sealeth. Now I want us to understand something for a moment. I can only be satisfied by God. 
If we were to look on over in Psalm 63, I, I don't want to take you there because I'm going to preach that tonight. But may I tell you, the only thing that's going to satisfy is the Lord. The only one that's going to be everything that you want Him to be is God. And David says, that, Lord, I, I, I'm in this wilderness. And Lord, I, I'm in this place that no one else is around me. I'm in this time of life that I feel all alone. And I'm so thirsty. And I'm so desirous. And my flesh it longeth for thee. The only one that's going to satisfy. The only one that's going to fill that void. The only thing that I need is you, Lord. And so I look and I think about why God's our contentment. Oh, we love the verse of Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 5. We always look at that very last part where it says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. But I want to bring up the first part of it. It says, and let our conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. May I tell you such things as we have is him. That's what it's speaking about. It's the fact that we have him. We could go on down a few verses in Hebrews chapter number 13 and verse number 8. The Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, I'm thankful that he's the same. I'm thankful that he doesn't change. I'm thankful that that word is still true. That we can still apply it today. That we can still take it and know that that's the truth. And that I don't have to look for another. And I, I know how I can have his presence in my life. I know how I can enjoy that communion with him. I know how I can have that time. Oh, we sing the song, he's all I need. And I don't know if it's he's all I need or he's everything I need. We, we sing a couple of them, and there's one that we sing more than the other as far as the choir. Uh, but I always think about how true that is. He is all we need. Over in the book of 2 Samuel, David had a son by the name of Amnon. And the Amnon enforced himself against his sister, Tamar, and raped her, and then cast her out. Now her brother, I know you're going to say, I thought Amnon was a brother. Well, half-brother. Her full brother was Absalom. And Absalom had just hit it in his heart. But Absalom was going to kill Amnon. And so time had passed. And he has a feast during the sheep shearing. He invites all the king, David, his father, and all of his brothers to come to the sheep shearing. And David says, I'm not going. And he says, at least let all my brothers come. And so David said, yep, all the boys can go. And Absalom kills Amnon. Now, because of that, Absalom is banished. Joab finds a woman and has her go before the king and plead a case or lie, if you would. And uh, Joab convinces the king to bring Absalom back. Absalom spends two years back in Jerusalem. And still hasn't seen the king. And Absalom sends to Joab. And Joab will not answer him. Joab says nothing back to him. But in 2 Samuel chapter uh, number 30. I'm sorry. Chapter number 14 verse number 32. By this time Absalom has had his servant set Joab's field of barley. That was ready for harvest on fire. And Absalom answered Joab. Behold I sent unto thee saying come hither that I may send thee to the king to say, Wherefore am I come from uh, Geshur? It had been good for me to have been there still. Now therefore let me see the king's face, and if there be any iniquity in me, let him kill me. Oh, my dear friend, what we need to cry out today is I'm thirsty for the presence of God. Oh, I'm thankful that I can have his presence when we come to the house of God. But I'm thankful I don't have to wait until I get to the house of God in order to have the presence. 
of God in my life. And I can spend that time with him and he can spend that time with me. Oh, I think about the, the presence of God that's missing from so many today. Oh, is he missing from your life today? Oh, would you just whet your appetite? Jeremiah's learning to whistle. My grandfather was a whistler. He whistled all the time. I remember when he would uh, work out in the shop and he would always whistle. And I don't know that he really ever had a tune. He just whistled. Jeremiah's learning to whistle. And I haven't taught Jeremiah about wetting your whistle yet, but you got to wet your whistle before you can whistle. And uh, he's, he's trying. Jeremiah's got his own little way of whistling. But it's... Uh, it's about wetting your whistle. I wonder if we'd wet our appetite and just say, boy, I sure thirst for the presence of God in my life. I find as well the third thirst that we find is thirsty for the power of God. Look at verse number two of our text in Psalm chapter 63. Look at verse number two. In Psalm 63, verse number two, the Bible says to see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Did you see that? In verse 2, he's talking about the presence when he says that I, I've in thy glory. But look at verse number 2 at the very first. He says to see thy power. You know what this world needs to see today? The power of God. why they mock God you know why they don't believe that there's a God because the ones that he wants to use to show his power are thirsty to see it because you know what this church needs to see the power of God every one of us need the power of God not just on our life but in our life I think about a man this kind of showed up on the scene in 1 Kings chapter number 17. He had showed up. Ahab was one of the most wicked kings that there ever was. In fact, the Bible records that his, his dad, Omri, was, was wicked. Wicked more than any of them before him. More wicked than Jeroboam that started uh, in the division of the north and the south. And uh, he was more wicked than Jeroboam that, that started idol worship again. And then Ahab was even more wicked than his dad and more wicked than Jeroboam and more wicked than all the other kings. And God sent his man Elijah. And Elijah walked up to Ahab and told him there's not going to be any rain until I say. And God had told Elijah to go. You go to the brook, Cherith. I'm going to feed you twice a day. You're going to drink water from the brook now I'm going to send ravens to give bread and meat. And he did. And then the brook dried up. And God said, Elijah, I want you to go. I've already talked to a woman. I've commanded her that she's going to feed you. And she's going to give you to drink. And she's going to take care of your needs. And uh, you're going to go there to Zarephath. And she's going to take care of everything you need. And he did. And then God told him it's time. And he comes back after three years of no rain. <laughs> Think about the condition of the land. Ahab had sent his right-hand man to go and, and search out half of the land, and Ahab would search out the other half. What they're looking for is a little bit of water. They're looking for a little bit of water so that they could feed their cattle and feed their horses. A little bit of grass so that they could sustain it, so that they didn't lose everything. And God says, Elijah, it's time. Elijah goes back. He goes to Ahab. I want you to pick up here in 1 Kings chapter number 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. It shows us what we need to see today. 
is the power of God. And I know you're going to say, Preacher, I, I thought it was when the fire came down. Now, hold on. I want you to see the condition. I want you to understand what's going on. I want you to see how, how Elijah uh, builds up things. Of course, we know that he had taken and he had rebuilt the, the altar. He had taken 12 stones according to the number of the tribes in verse number 31. The sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. Look at verse 32. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. Now I did some research on this. Because I don't consider seed to be very thick. Now, I don't know if he's talking about mustard seed or if he's talking about radish seed or if he's talking about green bean seed or what kind of seed he's talking about. Well, a measure set. If you were to have a cup, a measuring cup that's one cup, it would be one cup. It wouldn't matter how many seeds. You could fit more radish seeds in it than you could green bean seeds, but hey, it would still measure one cup. And so I started to do some research. I said, well, Lord, how much is one cup or one measure? He did two measures. It would hold two measures worth of seed. And so it's an exact measurement. And how much was that? Now, if you've got a study Bible, most of them are going to tell you that one measure is about four pecks. But if you go back and you start to look at uh, the uh, Hebrew in this, and you would look up what they were measuring and how they were measuring, you would find the equivalent of a dry measure here would be the equivalent of 6.7 quarts. 6.7 quarts. Now, if he did that twice, I'm going to do the simple math for you, that would be 13.4 quarts. 13.4 quarts. You say, preacher, what's that about? Well, that would also be 3.35 gallons. If we were to take that, 13.4 quarts, there's four quarts per gallon, that would be three point, almost a little over three and a third gallons that it would hold. Now, I bring us to that because I want you to look at verse number three, or 33. Look at verse number 33. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. They did it a third time. And the water ran around, I'm sorry, ran round about the altar. And he filled the trench also with water. <clears throat> Say, preacher, what's that about? Over in chapter 18, in verse number 3, the Bible says Ahab called Obadiah, that's, that's his right-hand man, he was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And Obadiah is the one that had, had uh, protected those priests that were, uh, the pro or protected the hundred prophets, and he hid them by fifty in the cave. And notice verse 5, And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go into the land, unto all fountains of water, and look unto all brooks, for adventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. In verse 6 it says, So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. Now bring us to this because I want you to understand what's happening. Where did they get the water? Elijah says, hey, there's four barrels. Go fill them with water. There wasn't any water. 
It was a dry and thirsty land. They'd had three years without any water. They'd had three years without any rain. Isn't it? Now, now hold on. You say, I, I'm not questioning the fact that they filled it. But I want you to understand how parched this land was. I want you to understand how dry this was. There was no grass growing. When the wind blew, all it did was blow the dust. There was no moisture in the air. God had shut down the, the fountains from heaven. Ahab had said, Obadiah, you go out and you look your direction. Don't go out and I'll look my direction. Don't overlook any fountain. Don't overlook any brook. We've got to find this. Elijah shows up and he says, there's four barrels. Go put water in them. And don't do it once. And they come back. Now, I don't know where they went. You know, I know some of you are going to preach. I thought you had the answer for me. I don't know. I just realized that they were in dire need to see the water come. They were in dire need to see the power of God. And God supplied water 12 times. You say, preacher, how do you know that? Because there was four barrels and he said do it three times. That's 12. I don't know how big in numerology you are. The Bible definitely has numbers in it. God is a God that knows numbers and has numbers. And listen, I don't get wrapped around the spokes of it, but 12 does have a meaning. Most of the time we look at it as the meaning of Israel. Because of the 12 tribes, the 12 children of Israel. As well, it also has a, a number. Now, I know seven is the number of completion, but may I tell you, 12 is considered a perfect number. And it symbolizes God's power and authority. And it's, not, it's also a number that's associated with government. But I would like to look at it right now is the fact that God's power needed to be seen. He said, go get those four barrels. I want you to put water in them. I want you to, to put water on this altar. I don't know how much those barrels held. It just tells us there was four barrels. We know that there was 12 barrels full that was dumped on there. In that, there was a trench that was dug around and it, was, it held 3.35 gallons worth of water. Now listen. Verse number 33. Elijah says fill four barrels. In verse number 35 the water ran round about the altar and he filled the trench also with water. Now, may I tell you that this was a lot of water. I know you're going to say, preacher, it was only a little over three and a third gallons. Listen, it was dry land. We haven't had any rain in a while. I was out watering the garden. And I, I got everything laid up on rows and kind of healed up as well because I found that it's easier to add water than it is to take water away. And as I had water in the garden the other day, I watered and I usually water until I get puddles and it runs. And I'm watering and I'm watering and I'm watering. And then I kind of go down. And I've got it set up where I can really go down about four rows or cover four or five rows at a time and it, I'll go down the middle and then I can spray to this one and I can spray to this one and I can spray here and I can spray here and I can spray here and I can cover all of these at one time. And then I'll back up and I'll do the same. Well, I, I will hit it until it puddles up and then I'll hit it until it puddles up and then I'll hit it until it puddles up and then I'll hit it until it puddles up and then I'll come back and I should be able to hit it and it puddles right up and I know okay it's saturated enough I can move on you say preacher what are you getting at listen to me each time they got those four barrels and they poured it on I'm going to do it right here they, they, I'm going to do it right here they, they went they got these four barrels and they, they brought them and they poured it on the altar and then I can see them so proud. They set those four barrels down. And they look up at Elijah. And Elijah says, boys, go, go get 
four more barrels. And so they go and they get the barrel. You know what's happened to that water while they're getting the barrels? Now think about this for a moment. Think about it. You want to talk about dry soil? It just soaked everything up. You want to talk about dry wood? It just soaked everything up. You want to talk about dry stones? It just soaked everything up. And they go, and they get these barrels again. And I can see them so proud. That they just got eight barrels of water in a place where they couldn't even find four earlier. You know how I know that those barrels were empty when they started? Elijah said in verse 33, go fill them up. Fill up the water. Fill, fill up those barrels. In a land that they had to search to find water. You want to talk about the power of God? He's already provided it. <laughs> they just had to go get it. They get these eight barrels. And they come up here with these next four. And they pour it on. And then the next one pours it on. And the next one pours it on. And the next one pours it on. And then I can see them come over here. And they set their barrels down. And they're so proud. And they look up at Elijah. And Elijah goes, boys, can we get four more? Come back with the next four. They pour it on. They pour it on. May I tell you, this is where we are today in a land that needs to see the power of God. A land that is desperate to see the power of God. A land that needs this church to have the power of God on it. A land that needs to know that there's still a God in heaven. I want to remind you of what's going on in this time. It wasn't dry because God was being mean. It wasn't dry because God had been tired of messing with them. It wasn't wanting to be their God anymore. No, it was dry because they decided they didn't want God anymore. And they wanted to serve Baal. And God said it's enough. It's time they see who the real God is. Remember when Elijah set this up and he talked to the prophets of Baal and he said, look, there's many of you. There's only one of me. You dress yours. I'll dress mine. You offer yours up and don't put any fire on it. You offer yours up. And they had all day. Couldn't get any fire to come. Couldn't even get any response. Don't you think that the people would have went, wow, where'd they just find four barrels of water? I already know who God is. He just provided 12 barrels of water. But then Elijah says, hold on a second. The one that calls down fire, the God that puts fire under that altar. Do you realize it would have just taken a spark to light that wood? And Elijah says, hold on a second. Let me show you my God. He's going to provide the water for a land that's dry and thirsty. Look at verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Look at verse 38. Then, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. And they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kish, Kishon and slew them there. And Elijah said to Ahab, Get thee up, eat, and drink, for there is a sound of abundant rain. I 
remember this year as Brother Danny was with us. And he had preached out of this passage of scripture and he had preached about the fact that the children of Israel came and they had said, the God, the Lord, he is the God. This world is so dry because they need to see that he is the God. Church, we need the power of God on us. We need the power of God in our life. We need the power of God to be real. Not just to us, but because we're in this dry land. That they would see that he is the God. Oh, my dear friend, are you thirsty today? There's a God in heaven wants to show himself real in the time you just get a barrel pour it on the altar I don't know how Elijah came I think it was something like this Lord God of Abraham of Isaac and of Israel turn the hearts of your people back and show them that you are the Lord. Shouldn't that be our prayer today? That we would just come to that place where we bow down before him and cry out, Lord, I need your power to be seen. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you. Lord, I thank you for your realness today, for meeting with us, for encouraging us. Lord, I'm thirsty. But Lord, I need a water that's going to satisfy for all eternity. Lord, I'm thirsty today. But it's not the temporal things of this world. I pray that you would help us today to set our eyes on you. That we had thirst for your purity, that we had thirst for your presence, that we had thirst for your power. And Lord, that you would be real to us in a land where no water is. But I'm thankful you're the provider of that water. Help us today, Lord, to walk away from here, letting others know where they can come get a cool drink of water that's going to satisfy for all eternity. Lord, I just 